The uh, title of this session is Cyber War is Congress Preparing for the Common Defense. I'm Lance Hoffman from George Washington University. I'll be moderating the session. Uh, and uh, uh, I will introduce the speakers very briefly, just name, rank, and serial number because their bios are on the net. And many of you know them already, but if you don't, they are, uh, you, you can go there because I want to save the time here for getting into the meat of the topic and then having enough time for questions and answers from the audience and for uh, byplay back and forth uh, 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 among the panelists and, and among the audience. Um, so uh, what we're going to do is start with uh, Shane Harris from the National Journal who uh, wrote a very interesting article uh, a couple months ago uh, on this topic. Um, we are going to uh, follow on a lot of pieces of paper already. Uh, I think uh, international studies. followed by Greg Nogin from the Center for Democracy and Technology, and uh, then uh, Robert Hollingham from the Business Software Alliance. And finally, I will chime in with some remarks and try to get some uh, uh, questions going uh, back and forth uh, among the panelists. Each panelist will have approximately, uh, well, we'll have no more than five minutes to state their piece uh, in the first round, uh, and then we'll uh, take, uh, uh, we'll have maybe 10 minutes or so for uh, back and forth uh, with the panel, and then we'll open it up so we give you folks uh, some time uh, before the lunch and the uh, keynote from Howard Schmidt uh, to ask your own <coughs> questions and, and so forth. So uh, with that, uh, let's begin with Shane Harris. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Uh, so uh, I guess being the journalist on the panel, I'm, I'm going to give you the lead uh, into, into this discussion. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to spend about five minutes talking about this piece uh, that Lance uh, alluded to that I wrote uh, in National Journal. It was a cover story uh, on November 14th called The Cyber War Plan. And what I want to do here is sort of just give everyone kind of a frame for discussion about, um, I guess, how the military and the intelligence community look at cyber war from an operational perspective and kind of what that means to them and um, hopefully tell uh, some enlightening stories about what that actually looks like to the degree that we know. This is obviously a an area that's pretty shrouded in secrecy, but um, I think we found some uh, some good information that we reported in the story, and so I'll try and give you some context this way. Um, the story is called the Cyber War Plan, and if there I there's maybe a bit of a misnomer because there's not per se a plan on the shelf for this, but if there is sort of a way of thinking about what this looks like, um, I think it started in May of 2007 uh, at a meeting in the White House with uh, then Director of National Intelligence Mike McConnell. Uh, who uh, came into that job with a huge amount of residual experience uh, in belief that cybersecurity was sort of the next domain in national security. Had done a lot of work in the private sector, looking at vulnerabilities in the financial system via data networks and hackers and foreign espionage, uh, and in a previous job was director of the National Security Agency, which plays really an outsized role uh, in cybersecurity at large, and we'll talk more about that. <clears throat> but at this time in May 2007, McConnell had come in as the DNI and um, was looking for a way to use cyber techniques and tactics to counter the insurgency in Iraq, which in the spring of 2007, as we all can recall, um, were racking up a pretty horrendous uh, IED attack uh, casualties against U.S. forces, coordinating many of those strikes with things like cell phones and telecommunications, and then videotaping or digitally videotaping and then posting these to the Internet. So you had sort of a command and control system and a propaganda machine that had a real cyber dimension. And McConnell clearly understood that this was a new kind of warfare, in a sense. Um, and tried to convey that personally to the president. Uh, and in this meeting in May of 2007, went in there looking for the president's authorization uh, to, as he has put it since, to conduct information warfare against the insurgents. Um, and what our reporting revealed was that uh, the sort of the crux of this operation was one whereby the National Security Agency would actually launch a very sophisticated targeted attack on these communications devices used by insurgents. And the idea here was to get inside the network and to create the capability to do certain things, like send false information, deceive the enemy, deny them access to certain communications. This became a really sort of central part of a big intelligence surge in Iraq at the time that was going on with the troop surge. We were getting better human intelligence on the ground, 
They were getting better uh, aerial reconnaissance from predators. And a lot of this cyber kind of stream, if you like, became part of an overall intel surge that sources who I talked to said was probably more effective in actually turning the tide of the war than the actual troop surge on the ground. So what we really saw here was uh, an example of potent cyber warfare, very targeted, very directed, combined with other uh, traditional military applications as well, um, that a lot of people think really was sort of a game-changing event. Um, <clears throat> I think this is a significant story and a good frame for us for two reasons. One is that it does illustrate the potency of cyber war and how the United States uses it on a very discreet level. Uh, but more importantly, I think it points up a kind of cyber warfare to which the U.S. is not engaged, uh, or at least that we don't know it's been engaged in right now. And this is a huge area that's unaddressed by our national policy, I think, and Congress is going to have to weigh in here, uh, or presumably might <laughs> want to. Uh, specifically, that is that the U.S. and military intelligence communities, as far as we know, are not engaged in very large and indiscriminate attacks on entire infrastructures things like power facilities and financial networks. Certainly they possess the capability to do it, but there's evidence that they've actually backed off of that uh, for some reasons that I'll illustrate now. Um, reportedly before the invasion of Iraq in 2003, there was a plan under consideration by military planners to essentially use cyber warfare to knock out the financial systems in Iraq that ran the banking system as a sort of a cyber precursor to a, a full-scale invasion, which makes a lot of sense. I mean, we do command and control infrastructure kinds of attacks in advance of traditional uh, bombing campaigns, invasions, et cetera, so this looked like sort of an obvious one. Uh, and reportedly, the military backed off of this when they realized that if you were to go after the networks that control Iraq's banking system, the attack could quickly spiral out of control and then cross over and infect other networks in friendly nations that are essentially connected to the same network writ large and possibly even blow back on the United States itself. So what looked at first like a targeted strike against Iraq could suddenly start knocking out banks and ATMs in France. Uh, and this was one reason why people <laughs> decided to, to back off of this and realize that perhaps maybe this wasn't ready for prime time, but also the fact of the matter was is that it looked like cyber in fact was a strategic weapon like the way we view a nuclear weapon, sort of a, a massive kind of uh, uh, strike, if you like. Um, I think it's telling that we've seen only probably two really full-scale examples of cyber war so far that we know of, both of which are reportedly, purportedly been launched by the Russians, one in Estonia in 2007 and another a year later in Georgia. But it does appear that as far as our military looks at this, um, we're not perhaps quite ready to go to that level of mass scale, and perhaps a lot of that has to do with uh, uh, the definitions of what is cyber war, uh, who has authorization for that kind of warfare, and what are the political and military ramifications of that. So with that as a frame, my five minutes are up, um, I want to sort of set that as a way of thinking about how we as a policy in this country sort of view this as a very um, potentially devastating and uh, perhaps unwieldy kind of new war. Thank you, Jim. Great, thank you. Uh, always happy to follow Shane, and now I'll disagree with him a little bit. Um, I don't. I don't actually like the time, term cyber war, and uh, you know I think we need to be uh, a bit more precise in in throwing war is a loaded term, right? And so we've uh, everything's a war in the United States now: war on terror, war on poverty, war on you know cats or something. Um, so. Cyber war, we, we might want to think about it a bit more precisely. And I think Shane has identified some instances of, of conflict in cyberspace that approach warfare. But we can benefit from maybe being a bit more precise. I'd like you to think about thresholds. When does something become war as opposed to something else, just conflict, right? Um, for me, the cyber crime, cyber espionage are not acts of war. Spying and crime are not acts of war. So the fact that this happens every day and it's undertaken by state actors and they're persistent and they're advanced doesn't mean it's warfare, right? We don't go to war over spying, right? In fact, it's not clear what we'll go to war over. War is a sort of a squishy concept. As you start to move towards damage and casualties, then you might be talking about warfare. So I think there's an implicit threshold, and as Shane pointed out, countries have been careful not to cross that threshold. You know, whether through um, some formal doctrine that we don't see or whether by just ad hoc processes, um, no one has yet entered into what I would call cyber warfare, right, with perhaps the exception of our work against uh, 
uh, jihadis in Iraq. Um, for me, what would cyber warfare entail, right? Um, it would entail disruption of services, and that's what happened in Iraq, right? Um, so critical services, you find some way to use uh, attacks over networks to disrupt them. Uh, it would entail the creation of greater uncertainty. So if you all know, you all remember Clausewitz, and Clausewitz talked about the fog of war and how this hampers commanders. The fog of war is uncertainty. What will happen? Where's the enemy? Where are my guys? If I do this, what are the consequences? Uncertainty slows down military campaigns. Uncertainty makes decision makers timid, right? <coughs> uncertainty gives your opponent an advantage. So if you can increase uncertainty, you've got, uh, you've got a benefit. And that's, of course, one of the things our opponents are thinking about. And the example is always, you know, blue force trackers. Suppose I could get in, and, which is tracking friendly forces. Suppose I could get in and monkey with that. You've got to bet that some of our advanced pr opponents are trying to figure out how to mess with blue force tracker. Finally, the third element, disruption of services, creation of uncertainty, and for me it would be kinetic effects. You all saw the Aurora test. Aurora showed that you can now use software, given the network nature and the reliance on digital technologies, the network nature of critical infrastructure, you can now use um, cyber attacks to have physical damage. Again, no state has done this. It's a big deal. Think about it. If you're China, you're not going to wake up and say, I'm in a bad mood today, so I'm going to disrupt power supplies in the United States through cyber attack, because they'll never figure it out. Nonsense. Would you take that risk if you were a leader? You would not, right? So we have not seen this kind of kinetic attacks. That does not mean they won't happen. If we get into a conflict with an advanced opponent, they have done the reconnaissance, they have done the planning, they have built the tools that will let them disrupt things like critical infrastructure. So this will be part of warfare in the future, but for me, we're in the stages before warfare, right? We're in the stages where people are poking around. Um, they're trying to figure out what are the rules, what are the thresholds, what's the other guy up to, a very early stage. But I, I don't actually think we've seen a case of certainly state versus state cyber warfare yet. Okay, Greg? So we're in a, a land where there's an awful lot of uncertainty. Um, <coughs> Jim pointed this out. I mean, we're not sure whether um, what's being seen is an attack or whether it's espionage. We're not sure where the attack came from, if it is an attack. And we're not sure, even if we know where it came from, who did it. So we don't know for sure whether it's a state actor or somebody else. Um, in that kind of, uh, oh, and then we don't know also whether if we respond with an attack, what the collateral damage will be on us, on civilians in the country where we think the attack came from, but we're not sure, and on civilians in other places. So there's all this uncertainty about just um, what has happened and what we should do about it. And then, and then you add to that, you add to that the notion that there are rules of war and there's not, it's not like we're writing on a blank slate here. There are rules of war that we would have to follow if we were to respond to an attack. Um, things like uh, uh, the requirement that the response be, a, uh, that the attack be on something that's, a, that's a, a military target. There has to be military necessity. You have to be able to distinguish between combatants and non-combatants. Um, your, your response has to be proportional to the attack. All these things are make the whole area, I think, extremely complicated and very difficult to figure out what to do. And the result, I think, is that we ought to be talking a lot more and focusing a lot more on the defensive side um, than on the offensive side. Because we're just not going to have so much clarity on the um, offensive side um, to act with, with um, the kind of authority that you normally see uh, on, on in, in, in a military campaign. Um, and I'm distinguishing um, between a case where there's already a military campaign, like in Iraq, mm -hmm. where we know we're going to be using kinetic force anyway, um, and, and focusing more on the uncertainty when there isn't that uh, kinetic uh, uh, action already underway. So if, if, if I'm right, and we ought to be talking ab in, in defensive terms, well, what should be um, the defense that we put in place. There's already ideas in Congress about what ought to happen. 
some are not such good ideas, um, and some um, bear, I think, some um, further exploration. So for example, when ideas, president ought to have the authority to shut down a critical system or to limit internet traffic to it when it's under attack and when there's an emergency. Um, uh, our view is that uh, that would be a very dangerous thing that actually um, uh, we can't think of a situation where the operator of a critical infrastructure system wouldn't quarantine it, wouldn't shut it down when the president thought it should be shut down um, because uh, it's under attack. Um, there's other proposals for uh, giving uh, uh, an entity of the government mandatory access to cyber security um, threat and vulnerability information and to any other information that the person seeking access thinks would be relevant to a cybersecurity mission, notwithstanding any law, including any privacy law. <coughs> well, that goes a little too far as well. Uh, maybe there ought to be better information sharing, but do we really need a statute that allows a governmental entity to override all privacy laws to get to that information? Uh, and then another uh, area, uh, hardening the target, uh, making software and hardware um, more uh, resistant to attack and more resilient when there is an attack. Uh, and uh, I know that we'll be talking about that more in the future. Our view is that uh, there are some ideas out there that could stifle innovation by trying to harden these targets, and we need to uh, avoid that. So big picture, um, cyberspace uh, as a battlefield is um, much more uh, complicated than uh, other military battlefields. It calls for um, caution, care, consultation with Congress, and uh, I think we need to focus uh, uh, our efforts on defense because on the offensive side there's so much uncertainty. Thank you, Rick Robert. Thank you very much. It's, it's good to see um, so many friends today and folks who have been following these issues carefully. Um, I think we could probably measure the interest and attention by this by noting that if we were to have had one of these e each prior year, uh, we probably uh, exponentially increased the size of our audience. And I think with a lot of the recent front page um, uh, events, uh, that the level of attention uh, this issue is getting is uh, right. Um, it is great to have a panel like this to raise the myriad issues, and I'd like to add a perspective in terms of this continuum of what happens when these issues of uh, warfare, vulnerability, cybersecurity come to us both in our offices and our homes, and how do we deal with these issues in an interconnected world. Um, it's important that as we talk about the cyber warfare threats that we do not lose sight of the fact that the majority, the vast majority of the malicious and harmful activity that's happening uh, via networks and the internet is um, not necessarily what we would view as warfare. Um, but it is now uh, financially motivated cyber crime, cyber mafia, organized criminals. Um, a few data points, again, as part of this continuum. Uh, Symantec, uh, one of our members, uh, has issued for many years now a widely read uh, assessment of cyber threats, uh, of one of a number of assessments that come out from industry and academia. And to give you a perspective, for 2008, the last full year for which they have data, 78% of the confidential information threats um, that they tracked exported data about individuals. Those of us here in this room, our friends, family, coworkers, others. 76 used a keystroke logger to steal information such as online bank account credentials. Again, I wouldn't necessarily say that cyber war, but the vulnerability is substantial and it's growing. Um, and then to look at the big picture in 2008, Symantec identified almost 1.7 million new malicious code threats. And that was a 165% increase over 2007 and a 1,077% increase more than 2006. 
So I want to get these data points on there because this really is a continuum and how we look at this from a public policy perspective, how we look at this both as citizens and as collective citizens of the United States and of the world community, there is a th common thread in this. Um, I'm not a military expert. Um, what I am is someone who can talk about the role of the private sector in this. Um, I would really start by using the word <coughs> innovation, which I think is really the theme throughout this. Just as government is looking at innovative tools to understand the cyber threats and how from what I've read, uh, offensively to use cyber um, vulnerabilities. Um, so too, we know that innovation is both from a software provider's perspective, what's driving the type of new investments that allow companies like Symantec and McAfee and Microsoft and others to track these threats and to do something about it. But it's also the tools that will be used by individuals and businesses to be able to respond to this. Today's panel, given the focus of the uh, Internet Caucus and this, uh, this uh, State of the Net conference, is really to talk about what's the role of government and what's the role specifically of Congress. I'd like to lay out uh, five things that I think are critical. Happy to discuss these in greater detail as we have time. One in this theme of innovation is the federal role in promoting a comprehensive cybersecurity research and development program. Right now, aspects of this are happening kind of throughout the government. Uh, a lot of good work, a lot of what's being done, but that needs to be better coordinated and more carefully focused. Uh, and we very much uh, support the House bill, the Lipinski Wu um, Gordon uh, Hall bill that passed the House uh, that begins to try to bring these things together so that we're approaching it not in a piecemeal fashion but in the type of collective fashion that makes sense. And we're hopeful that uh, as Rockefeller Snow and other Senate efforts move forward where they're looking at aspects of this, that they'll realize this is a huge opportunity to take what we're already doing now in many respects, but to have much better coordination. Secondly, is to secure final passage of a data breach bill. This is something that's been kicking around for uh, a long time. We have a uh, a House passed bill that came out of the Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee with Hatch and Leahy have their own bill. There are differences among these, but you know, why is this important? Three things. It's important so that uh, consumers have greater confidence, uh, so that we have uh, mechanisms to have market-driven security procedures, and we think that that is important. Third is getting a FISMA reform bill. Um, Senator Carfer is really leading a great effort on that. Um, federal agencies have the most sensitive data of any entities. They need to have a plan that po promotes actual security rather than paper security, and we think that that is an important, critical federal effort. Uh, finally, I'll add two on the table. Uh, one is we think there ought to be something like a cyber 911, which is a simple place where business organizations, when they are exposed to a cyber threat, believe they've been caught up in a bot that know readily and easily where they go to report that within the federal government. There are portals now, but that needs to be centralized. It needs to be easier. Uh, and finally, I would hawk back to the President's announcement um, last spring of the results of the Cyberspace <laughs> Policy Review and say, I think there's a great framework for how we should be looking at these issues as a nation. We should use that as a blueprint to track progress, and we should particularly focus on the international aspects of this. And as Secretary Clinton spoke last Thursday at the museum, it is about internet freedom, which is a huge part of it, but it's also about internet security. And the U.S. has a role of global leadership, and those are the five points that I would call for for congressional administration action. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Um, I'll just make a few comments based on what my uh, uh, preceding panelists have uh, have mentioned and then uh, let people uh, go back and forth for a couple minutes uh, there. I'm interested in, in Jim's uh, note that uh, asking, are we in the stage before cyber war, before, uh, is this the pre-warfare stage? Is this sort of like the 30s or something like that before World War II? How do you tell? I, I don't know. 
On uh, Greg's uh, comment about uh, focusing on the defensive side versus the offensive side, I'd like to hear a little more about that because um, I know that's sort of been some conventional wisdom, but as an educator, I'm not sure you can do only defense if you don't teach people how to do offense. And, and, and how does this, uh, how can you have it both ways? Uh, I am very concerned about having a defense that is not good enough because you haven't really looked at uh, how the offense really works. Um, um, in terms, of, actually also in terms of the uh, 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 holding back innovation, it's going to be very interesting if we get incremental, com complete, keep getting incremental changes in terms of hardware and software. Is that good enough? Or do we really have to go back and uh, in the longer term look at the technical architectures of what we're doing? I would say we may want to think about that because uh, you know we, we design, in some ways, we design computer systems today uh, like automobiles were designed in um, 1890 or 1900. I'm old enough to remember when I got my first driver's license and there were no airbags. In fact, there were no seat belts. If you hit something, you just flew out of the car and landed splat, you know. So we may want to uh, reconsider that and, and uh, have some uh, various incentives so we can sort of, to mix my metaphors, keep the plane flying while we're changing things uh, for the better, hopefully. Um, I'd love to see an economic model. Uh, there's no real model like a Forrester model in the 60s or anything like that of, uh, that I've seen that that's, uh, I'm happy with anyway of cybersecurity on the net that takes into account the various players, public and private, that takes into account the economics, that takes into account the social values like privacy, uh, put it all together, and, and it's all a mishmash now. You take the, the, the uh, uh, the, the contra attempts with uh, Google and, and China, you know, mm -hmm. it's all mixed together. Uh, fixing, par fixing a piece at a time, I am worried about that working. I, I know we're in the sausage making business here in this town, but uh, we may need to do a little better and uh, I'd like to see some new ideas on, on uh, how. Um, and also I'd like to know uh, who sets the rules. If we're in a, 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 a walk up to cyber warfare, um, uh, you know, do we have to wait for the net, for the cyber 9/11 to for our, our own little Estonia? I don't know, but uh, let me ask my panelists to remark on uh, that for a few minutes before we uh, um, go and open up for questions. So, uh, who would like to respond to these or any other uh, questions you have for other panelists? Well, I'll, I'll start, uh, and then I'll talk. I'll talk really fast so we can get through it. Uh, a couple reactions here. First, um, and I think this would fit in with what Greg's saying, I, I don't understand why the existing laws of war don't apply to conflict in cyberspace. So, and no one has made a good case to me. We haven't thought how to extend them. We haven't advanced our doctrine and our strategy. But as far as I can tell from looking at the laws of war, they work, right? We have to, there's some definitional things. What's a civilian target, you know? Um, so on the rules question, we have rules. We just have to figure out how to apply them. On the pre-war phase, uh, you know, I wanted to throw out a, the car metaphor is a good metaphor. Another metaphor to think about is um, what if we got rid of the Air Force and had the airlines defend our airspace? You know, because they have airplanes and they could fly against MiGs and Sukhois. <laughs> what? You're laughing. But, but when, we're talking about, when we're talking about the sort of threats that we face, particularly on the military side of cyber warfare, and that's why I want to focus on the definition, no private sector entity can beat them, right? Google's a good example. Huge company, very wealthy, high tech. They probably thought they were invulnerable. The Chinese creamed them, okay? And so we have at least four opponents in cyberspace who can beat any company on Earth, and we need to think about what would a realistic national defense look like in that situation. Um, I, I know some of these guys. Um, you know, they're just, think of entities, think of NSA existing in countries that don't have a constitution, right? Think of thousands of people with hundreds of millions of dollars whose sole job is to break into your network, right? They're going to win, right? So we need to think about not only the rules of warfare, but what are the larger norms that we want to address, right? The defense and the offensive question is a good one, and that will be the last thing I, I say. 
you know, I'd say I'm all in favor of great leap forward on technology. I just don't know how we get there. But defense versus offensive, in the 1890s, if you want to go back then, the U.S. thought offense is bad. We're a pacifist nation. So we'll build a navy that's only for coastal defense. And so we built little tiny coastal defense battleships that had a low <coughs> freeboard, if you know what that is. And they were dreadful, and they failed utterly, right? So a defense-only approach, we've tried it, doesn't work. Um, we need to think. We've got cyber command. How do we use it to increase deterrence? How do we take the offensive capability we've built and use it against some of these advanced opponents, use it against other opponents, like Shane mentioned? But we have to do that in the context of oversight <laughs> and law and chain of command. I don't think... Uh, a colonel or even a two-star or even a three-star should be authorized to launch some sort of cyber attack. Um, this is a big deal. Who makes the decision right now? It's not clear. So these are all the things we have to work through. But for me, I tend to take a narrower focus when we say cyber warfare and look at the military and international security perspectives. Clearly, today, we're, we're breaching over and looking at the whole range of cyber conflict and cyber security. And I, I think some of the other panelists will probably talk about that. Greg? So we need to address the, the most realistic scenarios. And the realistic scenario is not that we know that this country did this to us and it, and it, and it destroyed this uh, system and we need to retaliate. That's really not the realistic scenario because we're not going to know. We just don't have enough knowledge to act in the same way that we would act in a kinetic scenario. We don't have it. So when you account for that and all the uncertainty, um, that's why I think we need to think more on the defensive side when there is that uncertainty. Um, who sets the rules is a very good question. And uh, um, another way to look at it is who authorizes the activity that could um, get us as a nation into um, what we would all agree was a cyber war. Who's going to authorize that? What's the role of Congress in that space? You know, uh, when you look at the Constitution and the war making power in the Constitution, the, the President certainly has certain authorities, the Commander in Chief. He's the one who decides how a war will be waged. Congress is supposed to decide whether a war will be waged. Uh, and Congress, to assert its authority in the kinetic area, uh, enacted the War Powers Act, um, which requires consultation and congressional permission after the introduction of forces into hostilities. Well, what does a War Powers Act in the cyberspace look like? Where is the, what kind of consultation is required ahead of time? Is there time for uh, any kind of consultation at all? And uh, what kind of congressional permission ought there to be for continuing hostilities? When? Uh, I think that those questions, if they haven't been asked, uh, need to be asked and, and need to be focused on. Uh, and then a final thought uh, about uh, the Google situation. Who knows uh, Google's network, Google's activities, Google systems better than Google and is better able to defend them than Google? I, I would submit that the answer is that Google knows the most and that Google ought to be charged and is already taking steps to defend itself and that if there are pockets of information that intelligence agencies like the NSA have, um, if they have, for example, classified uh, attack signatures well, maybe those need to be shared uh, more readily with the Googles of the world so they can better defend themselves. Yeah, I'll just pick up on that, too. And, and one thing that I find fascinating about the Google story is it points to, I think, the outsized role that the private sector, and this goes to what Bob was saying, is playing in sort of a national deterrence strategy, if you like. And it's still unfolding. But what strikes me is that um, these kinds of attacks aren't new. They're happening all the time. It's just that no company has ever come forward and publicly admitted to them, and certainly no company on the scale of Google. Um, so there is now, it seems to me, um, almost a shame factor that, that takes place. Now everyone's guessing, who are the other 30 companies that got hacked in this attack? Google knows who they are, presumably. Are they going to say? Are they going to come forward? 
you know, it's, it really is up to these individual companies to do their own defense. I don't think anybody's going to argue that the NSA is going to be able to go out and protect corporate America and monitor every network and stop every attack. Um, I wonder to what degree a deterrence strategy is sort of forming right now because more and more companies might feel emboldened to come forward and say, yes, this happened to us and we want the State Department to do something about it and we now want to make a diplomatic issue out of this. It's something that it hasn't been in the past. It's, 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 it's boiling over into the public space now whereas it's been behind the scenes. And um, I, I think that, that sunlight on it could uh, be fairly powerful actually. Let me just say, I mean, I, I certainly share that sense of the sunlight, and I mean, there were other companies, uh, including Adobe, which is a BSA member, and others who, following the, the Google incident, said that they too had had uh, challenges arose. I think it shows sort of the interconnected nature of what we do. Um, I want to sort of respond uh, uh, to Lance's uh, provocative uh, analogy to the automobile and whether we should really go back and kind of rethink um, the, the way hardware and software is developed. Um, one, I think there has been more attention focused certainly within the software industry but in our hardware members on how you build in security and bake in security and products from the design phase through the use than ever before. I think that is not something that uh, engineers were thinking about as actively as they are now, just as I think the original engineers who develop automobiles were thinking first about mobility, and then secondly, as that was taken for granted, they were thinking about how to build in the security aspects. I use the word inter incremental changes. I think the question is, were airbags and seat belts dramatic changes or were there incremental changes? And I think they change the equation of security and it really is sort of a non-issue of whether it's incremental or substantial, but I think they were building off an existing system. So too, I think what we have now is enormous awareness from day one in organizations and certainly in software and hardware companies about the role of security. Um, the key is how does that interface with the enormous market power that the federal government has and with federal action to ensure that federal networks are secure. And in this case, I think that the blueprint is actually relatively clear when we're talking about things outside of the classified space, which I can't, I'm not privy to, but I think in terms of the uh, unclassified framework, it's clear. I think what gets in the way of this is um, something that gets in the way of all legislation, but we find ways around, which are jurisdictional differences among committees and how they pair these up. But as I concluded by referencing the President's uh, Cyberspace Policy Review, I think if there's a blueprint like that that is used by Congress to know what we're trying to accomplish, then you can deal with the jurisdictional issues as opposed to simply having things bubble out of committees without an overall plan. And I think there's about as good of a plan that's been outlined as any I've seen with that, with that blueprint from the White House. Let me make a couple quick points. I guess we're going in circles here, but uh, on attribution, one of the dilemmas here is that the, this, a lot of this does occur in a classified space. And so um, my own guess would be that we actually have strong attribution in 25 to 30 percent of the attacks, right? So the question is, in those cases where we have strong attribution, hey, and guess what? Two countries appear over and over again. Um, is that enough evidence to say we should be allowed to take action? In any other sphere, the answer would be yes. So I'm sort of, you know, eager to see us move in the same direction in cyberspace. The second issue is there's sometimes you can deduce attribution. Now, let me think here now. I'm thinking of a country that is really concerned with tracking human rights activists in Tibet. Botswana, of course. How did I forget? No, of course. There's sometimes, yes, in many cases we don't have good attribution, but in a, in a significant minority of cases we have sufficient attribution to undertake action. And that may not be on a public level, it may not be on an unclassified level, but that does not remove the responsibility from the President or from the Congress. Um, on the issue of who's best qualified to defend, I think we should come back to that too. And, you know, I apologize for being sort of military focused here, but the military term here would be point defense, right? I'll defend my foxhole and the guy next to me will defend my foxhole and the guy will defend my foxhole. And we've seen people try that and they always lose, right? 
And that's what we have now. We have a point defense. Um, it's kind of, it's appealing, I guess, if you're in one of those militias in Montana, you know, where you're going to defend yourself. But it doesn't work against a real opponent, right? So one of the things we want to start doing is breaking down this problem into the different sets. There are criminals. How do we deal with them? Probably not a military issue, right? There are state actors. It's certainly a military issue. And unless we can find a way to use offensive capabilities as part of a deterrence or a strategic defense, we will be unable to defeat these opponents. With that, I'm going to uh, thank my panel and move on. And, and, and now it's your turn. Open up to uh, some questions from the audience. I'd ask you to uh, be brief, if you could, and to state your name and affiliation, if you would. And other than that, anything is fair game. So who would like to go first? Is your hand? It, okay. I'm, I'm John Kern with Telecommunications Reports. Um, back to what you were talking about a few minutes ago about corporate disclosures of attacks and the fact that a lot of times you don't get them and sometimes you do. Do you think anything will ever evolve in Congress or elsewhere that would make that more of a mandatory thing? And uh, the only thought I have on that is if you're a public company now, you have an adverse event make an SEC filing or, you know, there's some notification that has to come at some point. Will some structure like that evolve? Well, um, two things. One, I think it certainly in elements like the data breach legislation uh, where consumer data is uh, compromised, there are provisions for notification. Um, so that begins to address part of that, and we think that there are good aspects of that because it will put private sector incentives in to build in security within organizations. You know, I think the second part of that is, you know, how do uh, companies easily and readily communicate with the government um, for information that may not go to the consumer risk, but go to a pattern of development um, of, of risk that we see sort of across networks. Uh, there, I think, again, my Cyber 911 9 number, 911 number was just to say we need to make that easy for every company to know where to go to do that. We need to ensure that that is not disclosed if it doesn't go to issues like consumer harm because you don't want to create disincentives to providing that information uh, to the government. I think a lot of this is already happening, but part of it is just to sort of track the nature of threats. The challenge becomes one of scale which is if you take the Symantec data that I referred to of the exponential increase in the number of threats and malicious code, I would argue it becomes virtually impossible for every one of those to be disclosed to a federal agency. And the federal agency would, wouldn't know how to deal with it. So the question becomes, for those that are meaningful and for patterns that are there, how do you encourage that disclosure in a way that protects security but doesn't ultimately jeopardize the financial security of the company that's engaged in reporting that to the government? And I think there's still some work that needs to be done on that. Anybody else? If not, we'll take another question. Okay, over here. Bob Nielsen, uh, United States Army. Uh, Most policy, especially in this realm, comes directly from the National Security Strategy of the United States. The National Security Strategy of the United States is woefully inadequate on this particular topic. What would you advise the Obama administration to do and or successive administrations to include in the National Security Strategy of the United States to address this issue? That's you, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping somebody else would Here take it. Yeah. Um, huh. Well, uh, Jim, you'd say start with defense, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a larger debate about whether we can ever have an adequate national strategy and whether having an adequate national strategy was sort of an artifact of a period. You know, we used to be a great power, and it sort of ended maybe five or ten years ago. And, um, oh, I'm just kidding. No, we. We, we had a very coherent approach and mechanism for coming up with solutions during the Cold War. And after the Cold War broke down, there was a period of 
10 years of wandering in the wilderness looking for a national strategy, uh, we still haven't gotten it right. So there's two different issues, though. The first issue is the larger national strategy. Um, that clearly needs to be rewritten. There are efforts to do that. I still think, this will sound funny, it's a little <laughs> DOD-centric, right? So we tend to think, and part of that is because DOD is the, maybe the last functioning <coughs> agency in the government. But, you know, we tend to write things and say, this is, you know, from a military perspective when it comes to international security. Getting back to that, and there's been a lot of discussion, who will be the George Kennan? I know mm -hmm. 10,000 people in the academic world who want to be the next George Kennan. When will <coughs> the next Solarium project come up? Well, we tried twice and they've both been bust. If this is code to you, ask me about it. So rethinking the national strategy, redefining our interests. Within that, you have to do the cyber piece. We do have a cyber strategy. It was out of date uh, about 20 minutes before it was released, right? So it's from 2003, and now it's fabulous, uh, fabulously out of date. So my advice to the current administration is, and this picks up on some of what my colleagues have said, uh, Robert, Lance, Greg, Shane, you have a proto-strategy laid out in the 60-day review and the May 29th speech. It involves international engagement, thinking about norms, improving our defenses, and taking that kernel of an idea and turning it into something concrete and actionable would be a good thing to do over the next three years. Let me, uh, not being an expert, let me rush in where angels fear, fear to tread on this and say, uh, follow the money. Look at the reward structure. If you want to get a reward strategy, I don't have one to get one today, but I have, a, I hope, a way to get something in five years or ten years. And that is, um, and this comes from not the DOD-centric, but it's the university-centric. Throw money, throw grant money out there in a major competition to do this so you get away from the DOD centricity and you have, because it's more than DOD, it's economics, it's, it's uh, public policy, it's a whole bunch of things all put together and it's by, oh by the way, anybody knows it's global, so you know, how much of this is, what is national makes sense, what does national not make sense. And have some, uh, make it sexy for smart people to work on it rather than do other things. I'll stop there. Well, that got them. Look, all these hands. <laughs> uh, Annie? So I'm Annie Anton. I'm on the faculty at North Carolina State University. I'd just like to follow up with what Lance said. I think it's not just a, a matter of finding something sexy and having a competition, but there's also a real big challenge that researchers are facing, which is that the way that we structure the, um, the way that we structure our programs for which we can apply for funding for basic research has been changed so much that we basically have one or two shots a year to get funding. And where when I was an assistant professor, I had many opportunities to submit an idea. And so I submit the sure thing that I knew I could get funded by the National Science Foundation, but um, I'd also submit something that was high risk and very innovative. And I could take that risk because I had multiple opportunities to apply for grants. And even though everything that we read about what they're looking for and they want to find is high risk, highly innovative work, they'll never find it. And we know it. So we're not submitting our innovative ideas. We're submitting our safe ideas. And what's happening is that researchers in other countries are getting funded to do that high risk. And the innovation is happening elsewhere. And so I think it's not just a matter of increasing the amount of money that we fund, but the way that we structure the way that we deliver that. Now. Okay. Well, you've highlighted, no one else, everyone should jump in. You've highlighted a larger problem we have with, I don't know what you want to call it, innovation policy or innovation system. The good news is, though, that broadband and net neutrality will fix that. So, um, well, that didn't work. I thought that was a good joke. <laughs> now, we have this larger problem. I'll be eager to see what the President says tonight in the State of the Union address. It's been in previous State of the Union addresses uh, that President Bush gave. How do you fix, how do you accelerate uh, innovation in the U.S.? And this is part of it. Um. We have time for uh, one more question before uh, lunch. Ah, oh, such a, all right, just in the back of the room. Oh, he's holding up the camera. So somebody else, put your hands up again real quick. Okay, this gentleman. 
James Miller of the FCC. I wonder if uh, particularly Mr. Lewis could comment on some commentary that I've heard mostly from academics that following on this discussion about research topics and kind of the safety zone and the more innovative zone, topics that relate to what I think a military strategist or somebody would feel comfortable with as an offensive strategy in the context of cybersecurity is not apparently viewed uh, maybe favorably as maybe something to be more defensive in focus. I wonder if you could comment on whether or not you think that's sort of a prevailing view, um, and then also whether or not maybe that reflects maybe a, a different perspective. You've noted on several occasions, you know, this is maybe a view or not. I wonder if that's an area that maybe uh, would require a maybe broader perspective or what benefits that might be. Well, I, well, let me see if one of my other colleagues wants to say something. I know they want us to talk fast, but Shane does this all the time, and Greg thinks about it, and Robert, so maybe do one of you want to? Well, I mean, is, is the question, I mean, uh, uh, just making sure I understand the question you're asking, to try and facilitate offensive research in the private sector through grants and things like that? Should that be changed? Is that yes. your question? All right. Let me, let me mention my panelists. We have about two minutes left to finish everything. Yeah, I, mean, I'm not, I don't mean to punt this. I'm not in the business of, of policy prescriptions. We try and stay away from that in journalism. But I mean, <clears throat> it seems to me that this is something that the DOD Cyber Command is going to have to wrestle with fundamentally. I mean, it's being stood up not just to be a defensive component. It's clearly an offensive component as well. And they're going to have to figure out the harmony between those two things. And I think a lot of the reasons why you're perhaps not seeing the discussion of the offensive side in public is because it involves highly sophisticated and deeply classified techniques that if they ever got out into the open, presumably someone could use them against us. So there's always that, the research component, it seems to me, always has that double edge to it, is that you don't want to perhaps get out-researched by your adversary. Okay, we, I'm going to squeeze in one more guy, this gentleman here. Uh, and then uh, ask it quick, we'll answer it quick, and then we're going to have to uh, wind it up and to get to the lunch. Bruce McCulley says, and uh, going back to the question Mr. Harris asked about the definition of what is cyber warfare, I'd like to suggest that uh, viewing the situation we're in now as analogous to the 1930s and the run up to global conflict may not be the right paradigm. It may be more recent the Cold War against the Soviet Union, which was not ended because of any force of arms or conflict, it was economic collapse. And the question I have is, with the uh, uh, incident with uh, Google and 30 other companies and uh, things like the Zeus botnet, should we be viewing this cyber warfare as an example of a form of economic warfare in which there are no non-combatants, let me ask all of my panelists who want to address that to answer it in, you know, 20 seconds or less. <laughs> can, can start with a yes or no, and we can move this discussion then, a movable feast, into the real non-virtual feast. I'll go real quick. I think we need to look at it as uh, cyber espionage. That what this is is about stealing in most cases, and that we treat espionage differently than we treat uh, war. And I'll just say the economic and military consequences of this are completely inter interlinked. And I'll make a plug for Howard Schmidt's presentation after uh, launch. Uh, someone that we've been you know, waiting to see named for that position a long time. And uh, I think these things fall right on his plate. Ladies and gentlemen, thank, join me in thanking the panel. <laughs> and thank you. Um, we're asked to clear the room and move to lunch. Thank you.